on Knicks fans. Welcome, welcome. Uh, big trade that just broke, which will be a lot of fun to tackle. But in the meantime, uh, hope you're all doing well. We are a little bit more than 24 hours away from the draft. And welcome to Cap Rules Everything Around Me, Cream, Get the Money, Dollar Dollar Bills, y'all. I am your host, Jeremy Cohen. Really exciting day today. We've got uh, this here, this right here, which should be a lot of fun. And then we're going to take a little break. And then you got Chris Persianen doing Dream, or Draft Rules Everything Around Me, Dream. Uh, it's great, especially because I guarantee you that this is actually the one and only time you can say that you creamed and then dreamed in an appropriate context. I think that's wonderful. It's great. I can't see my producer, Andrew Claudio's face right now. I would imagine it's buried in his hands, and I'm not sorry. So moving on, uh, here's what we can start with. The trade. I was going to have a whole thing opening up about uh, trade player exceptions and whatnot. We'll still get to that. In fact, we could actually talk about it right now because Jeremy Grant was just traded from the Pistons to the Trailblazers, presumably in the uh, traded player exception. It was a little bit more than $20 million. Um, it was created when the Pelicans acquired CJ McCollum. So uh, basically, we've talked about this a little bit before, whether it was on Cream or uh, just more standard podcast with John that uh, that trade player exception, Jeremy Grant could slide into that this year. But the moment that the calendar flips to the new league year, uh, the 2022-23 season, then the trade player exception actually would have been too small to absorb Grant's salary. So I'm not surprised that this happened. This kind of felt like something that was inevitable for a while. Um, you're probably not surprised out there either. So uh, basically the trade that was made was um, it was Detroit swapping. Well, they first of all, uh, Detroit traded Jeremy Grant to Portland 2025 first round pick via Milwaukee. Uh, this is all per Woj. That pick was acquired by way of the McCollum trade. Um, basically, it was it would have been the 15th pick, but the Hornets got that instead. Thanks to Devonte Graham and. Something that happened a while ago, so the Pelicans making the playoffs actually screwed over the Blazers quite a bit. This is not going to be a good pick. At least it shouldn't be as long as Giannis Antetokounmpo, Chris Middleton, and Drew Holiday play like they've been playing in the year 2025. Uh, Detroit also swaps the 2022 second-round picks. They get 36 for 46 with Portland. Um, Denver, jumping in here, gets a 2025 second-round pick back. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, Woj also corrected himself. Uh, Detroit, not Denver. Denver's not included. Detroit gets a 2025 second round pick back from Portland, and Portland sends the most favorable 2026 second round pick uh, between Portland and New, New Orleans to Detroit. So um, some interesting things going on, obviously. Um, one of them, of course, I guess we could just start with Portland, right? I know a lot of folks were having... Uh, the trade player exception and trading like Burks and Noel and all these other people into that trade player exception. My feeling had always been the Blazers can do better than that. And they did. And they have Jeremy Grant is a better player. The question then is, okay, well, where do they go from here? Because you think well, the Julius Randall angle, they probably don't need Julius. Um, if they do, then it would have to be blood. So it would have to have been blood. So before, but it would have to be blood. So now, Blazers also keep the seventh pick overall. It'd be interesting what the Pistons are up to because they already had a lot of money to spend in free agency, and now they have an additional $20 million. So what could this mean? Well, um, for them, maybe they do throw a max offer at DeAndre Ayton and he bites. Maybe, you know, the Suns could easily just match and bring him back and then trade him six months or so from now or from when he would have the offer matched. Maybe they can work out a sign and trade. There's also the angle of Jalen Brunson. Are they going to, are they willing to overpay Brunson paying him his max contract, which is also 30 and a half million dollars. Same as it is with Deandre Ayton. I don't know. I mean, that's $60 million. They can't, they don't have quite that much room, but they might be able to make something happen. They may not even need to do that. If they, you know, they, they could find a way to clear more money. And another way of doing that is actually, if they trade down, if they traded from five to whatever, let's say it's 11 where the Knicks currently sit, they'd be saving about $3 million in cap space. Uh, and that's also interesting to note because if the Knicks were to do that, 
depending on what else would be on the deal, they would be gaining $3 million in cap space, which of course impacts free agency and all that. Um, but while we're talking about the trade player exception, what I was originally going to say in regards to the Celtics, and if you know me, you know I hate giving them credit, but credit is absolutely deserved for what they did. They entered last offseason over the salary cap. They couldn't re-sign Evan Fournier, but they didn't want to. So they signed and traded him and created a $17 million trade player exception. Uh, in the meantime, they also created some other ones. They did one with Tristan Thompson. Uh, the bottom line is right now they have th- uh, five traded player exceptions uh, over $5 million. And so it's great for a team like them because it's avenues to add salary. Look at the Lakers, right? The Lakers can only really add the taxpayer mid-level exception. The biannual would get them hard capped. They can't do that. The um, full non-taxpayer would get them hard capped. They can't do that either. Um, They can't do a sign and trade with Kyrie, which is this whole $6 million trade player exception or uh, the, the, the tax, excuse me, so many exceptions, the tax, mid-level exception that would be around six million dollars Kyrie's not going to sacrifice 30 million dollars to sign there although it's Kyrie so who really knows but I just don't see it so the Celtics are set up in a way where they can keep growing and that ultimately is what you need to do if you're a team that's well over the salary cap and you don't want to worry about you know like or, or the concern is how do we add better quality talent the Celtics are an interesting factor because then it comes back to a player like Alec Burks If the Knicks wanted to dump Alec Burks into the Tristan Thompson TPE, they could do it this year, especially on draft night. Um, I don't know. Maybe they trade uh, Burks and their second round pick next year for Boston's first round pick and it's top 20 protected, something along those lines. Like that's the type of move they can do. The question then is why are the Knicks doing it? Well, there are two reasons. If they want to stay above the salary cap, And um, if they do that, then they get a trade player exception of their own for dumping Burks into Boston's trade player exception. That would be a trade player exception of a little over $9 million. If they want to trade Burks as a way to get Brunson and go under the salary cap, then they would keep clearing money. And then eventually they'd renounce the trade player exceptions, be an under the cap team, and then presumably get Brunson. The Brunson news is really interesting. I'm sure we'll get into it, but just a few very quick points. And then I, I want to get to your comments. Uh, anything that's leaked right now is intentional. It just is. There's nothing that is accidentally out there. So for Brunson, it could be that Leon Rose is trying to get his godson paid. It could be that the Knicks genuinely want Jalen Brunson and they're doing everything they can. Um, it could be that they're trying to say to Sacramento, we don't need Ivy or like, we're not Ivy or bust. We are willing to go other routes, come down from your offer. It's too much. Let's meet in the middle. We don't need Ivy. We can go Brunson and keep going on the course, keeping our picks, drafting a good player at 11, and just kicking the can down the road, still finding a way to trade up next year or trade for a star. So it's leverage at play in a lot of different ways. I'm not doubting Jake Fisher or his reporting. I I understand what was, you know, in terms of like Brunson staying, he's telling his teammates, all that. Maybe that's the case. Um, The question, of course, then is, can things change? Things can always change. There are always decisions. Look at DeAndre Jordan and the Dallas Mavericks. So um, that's the whole thing with TPEs. Thank you to Portland for giving me a new angle to talk about right now. Um, so without further ado, let me get to some of your questions and your comments. Uh, the first is, oh, I can't scroll up. Um, we are kind enough to have, well, I'll let, let me start. RXMCY. Hey, Jeremy, you had a take from an older pod that you believe the Knicks will land either Brunson or Ivy this summer. Do you still believe that take? I do. And at this point, I don't know about you all. I feel like obviously if the Knicks don't get Ivy, they don't get Ivy. I would at this point though, it feels like it would be from my perspective, uh, disappointing just because uh, for lack of better term, blue balls, like this is what's being built up. Yes. If we choose to believe it, that's our own mistake. But I think that it'd be great if the Knicks could do something that is, appealing that fits their timeline that fits the timeline the fans want this to me for ivy is the move um but I, to me they need to get at least one of these players because you can sell it in a different couple different ways depending on how you acquire them which player you're acquiring other moves you can make but uh yeah i, I do i do believe that um from mark ham thank you mark for the super chat contribution hey jeremy how's it going it's going well stressful but good 
Um, is it possible that we extend Mitch, sign Brunson, and trade for the fourth pick? Wouldn't Julius have to go? That is possible. Um, it definitely is. Julius would not have to go. Basically, here's what the, the order, or the sequence of events would be. Uh, first, I mean, it really depends if the Knicks go over the cap or under the cap. Uh, number one, they would get Ivy in this case. Number two, if they go under the cap, then they would have to clear out money and then sign Brunson, but they could also go over the cap and do it. If they go under the cap, they have to sign Brunson and then they can extend Mitch because of his cap hold. That's the last piece of the puzzle. If they decide to go over the salary cap with Jalen Brunson and acquire him by sign and trade, then it's interchangeable. They could get Brunson and then sign Mitch. They could sign Mitch and then get Brunson, but it has to be if they're over the cap. Julius doesn't have to go in either of those circumstances. Uh, the question is, would he? I mean, I don't think this will happen. It, I'm just saying this could happen, where let's say the Knicks clear cap space and then they sign Jalen Brunson, but uh, the signing of Jalen Brunson is actually a sign and trade. And the Mavs then can create a, it's called a $25 million traded player exception, $26 million. If that traded player exception is large enough, then the Knicks could theoretically dump Julius Randle into the trade player exception. The Mavs could absorb him. And that's how you would do a Brunson for Randle sign and trade. It's complicated. I don't think it's likely, but that's how you would do it. That's the one way that you would have to feature Julius. And you still don't have to with any of these situations. It's more just, can you? Yes. Do you need to? No. Is it harder to do with Julius and Brunson? hundred percent because of base year compensation. Uh, from Kevin Danishevsky, will both fume if they give up this year or next year's first for Brogdon? But how angry would you be if they give up Dallas's 2023 first? I still wouldn't be happy at this point. You know, like I, he he misses games. Clearly, they're trying to leverage his value to the point where it's extremely salvageable. If the Wizards want to give up number ten for Brogdon, then they can be my absolute guest. I I, I don't I don't mean to say that Brogdon's a bad player. He's not. He is a good player. The problem is that. Father time is undefeated and he's certainly injured and you just can't pay a premium for a player who is not going to play as all indications are due to his track record. The same thing goes for Hayward. You know, you don't want to, to pay to take on Gordon Hayward's contract. It's something that you would hope to be rewarded for in some capacity due to the extra years and the money and the amount of time that's being missed. So I would be upset if that pick were used to get Brogdon because I think you can find players who... I don't want to say they're better than Brogdon, but they're more consistent. At least, you know that you're getting them. But at that point, I would really just probably prefer to start Emmanuel quickly, have Derek Rose off the bench. And when Rose gets hurt because he misses time, it's just inevitable. Then Deuce McBride takes on more of a role. And Hey, maybe Ivy's here. Maybe you do that too. Um, also from Kevin. Oh, no, that was from Kevin. De Kevin Denishevsky. Thank you, Kevin. Um, from Mino F. Jeremy, with Grant and Wood both being traded for late first, should we assume that this is Randall's likely value on the market? The only the only thing with Grant and with Wood is they are expiring contracts. You can look at it two ways. Number one, teams are comfortable not having multiple years of control. Or the other way, which is that they these teams save the headaches of having to worry about contractual disputes with Randall. Randall's making a little bit more than both of these players. Um, decent amount more than Wood and a little bit more than Grant. Again, I still don't think his value is quite as bad as I know a lot of Knicks fans do. That will be you know, proven over time, whether it's right or wrong. We'll see. For me, I still go back to if Obi's not included in a trade-up for Jaden Ivey, then what do you do with Randall? What do you do with Randall and Obi? As we've discussed, it's not a clean fit. Hopefully, there's a resolution. Again, I know that it's easy to get pessimistic or even cynical and say, well, we've heard all these rumors about other players. We've heard nothing about Randall. He's not going to get moved. I don't know. We could also say the same thing of other teams are trying to figure things out. Maybe there's a way that after that, something clears up their backup plans, but they're not announced. I'm not really sure, but I do think that, yeah, if you're trading Randall, you're trading a starter for what you would hope to be um, another sort of pick equity and salary filler. That to me would be ideal, um, but it's not the Bledsoe swap. It's not all these things. Again, the only thing with the Bledsoe swap is if it gets you closer to Ivy because you're having issues getting up from 11 to four, but um, 
That'll be determined in the next 25 or so hours. Uh, Steve Savale, in your opinion, what is the percent chance that Julius is a Nick to start the next season? And has that percentage moved at all in the past week? I, I go back and forth on it. My, I just don't know how you wipe away all of last season and start fresh. I understand that the Lakers are trying to do it with Russ. I get it. I'll say this. I, I do believe a solution can be found for Julius. That's very vague. I admit that. Question, of course, is, is it worth it for the Knicks to give up on Julius, considering Obi and all these things? So I'll say there's a 60% chance he's here, but I really have no idea. I, I'm as much in the dark about this as you all, as a lot of people, as, as most probably are. Um, but considering how he's under contract, they wanted to give him the deal. It doesn't mean they can't move him. But just all these things being considered, I, I feel like the house has to lead with him being here but I still would like there to be a trade that's explored uh, from Justin Schwender. Hey, how's it going, Jeremy? In terms of making a deal for Jaden Ivy, how would you rank the young players in terms of your willingness to include them in a deal from most willing to least? I'd say for me, the player I'm probably most comfortable with is Cam um, just based on contract situation where he has to be paid and we don't really know what he is. And he's very much a beauty is the eye of beholder player. Um, maybe Sacramento or Detroit loves, you know, Cam Reddish. Maybe they don't, and you have to figure something out. I think it's good to start with a player like him. Uh, then I'd go Grimes because of the fact that Grimes is expendable from an archetype standpoint. I'm sure there's more he can do that he hasn't been able to showcase, especially with the pull-up pull shooting. But I think you can also find a player of his archetype more easily. The benefit of Grimes, the value that he has is, well, you get a good shooter and a good defender. Um, you get three years of team control on a really dirt cheap contract drafted 25th overall. That's important. And I think that has a lot of value. I, I think after that's probably quickly. Uh, and I don't think that the Knicks have any interest in trading quickly, but I don't really know. It's the thought process of, okay, well, yeah, you could bring Ivy in here. Do you have to use quickly to get them? I think there are other ways you can do it. Uh, you know, the thing about this is because Ivy is not a proven talent, there is still a risk on the Knicks part, and that has to be factored into the equation. Yes, is there risk for any trade? 100%. But you have a known, uh, you know, you have a known player in any star that you have. You know what their injury history is. With a prospect, it's a little bit different, which is why I don't think it's that much more outrageous than 11, um, this year's pick, or excuse me, 11, another pick, um, a young player, Maybe salary filler if that's what gets it done. You know, I I had pitched uh, two for, or I guess it was three first Grimes and Burks, and even that might have been too much. So we'll see in the time. I, I think that even Jonathan Wasserman said this on most recent pod with John that the asking price will kind of come down at a certain point from Sacramento. It's just the nature of how the leverage and deals go. So um, yeah, you know, I, I think then you get to Ob and then you get to RJ, but. With Obi, it's a little bit tricky because of the whole Randall factor. So I could see if there was a way of, well, we can get Jaden Ivey into the building, it cause you know, costs us Obi and some other assets, which would then also bring down on the back end because you wouldn't give up a ton if you can get Obi in the building. Uh, if you're Sacramento or I guess Detroit, that certainly benefits you. Um, pay less as a result of it, and then RJ. Just that's that's how I do it, and I think that the Knicks probably don't do it too dissimilar from that. So we'll see. Uh, Barry Craver, did Jeremy paint the picture in the background? His talents extend past salary cap analytics. No, I did not paint that. I can also promise you it looks a lot nicer in person than, uh, it does through a screen, but that's most things with a screen. Um, yeah, it's a little bit more vibrant. It's actually blue and orange, which is great because I love the Knicks. And as, as I think you guys know that by now, um, let's see, what do we have next here? What do we got? Well, thank you, um, Adam Liebwitz, for the Super Chat contribution. Really appreciate that. And um, here we got Jeremy E. with a Super, Bat, super Chat con uh, contribution. Thank you, Jeremy. If the Knicks get Ivy, is it more likely, less likely, or will it have no impact on whether they sign Brunson? To that, I would say the biggest impact is what happens with next year's pick. If the Knicks give away next year's pick unprotected, then I think it makes a whole lot of sense to get someone who is a 
player like Brunson, you know, if they can help the development of the younger players, if they can help you win games and kind of push that pick out of the range where it's super valuable for the Kings or the Pistons or whoever other team might have it, then I think it is important to get someone like Brunson. If the Knicks don't have to deal with uh, next year's pick, they keep it. It's it's theirs. They can just mess around and they have some safety net. Then I think it doesn't really have an impact. And if the Knicks have a somewhat protected pick, let's say it's top 10 protected, then I think there's a really good argument for no, no, no. I like We know the Knicks aren't going to tank, but there's something to be said of don't push your chips in too much to the point where you're picking like 12th or 13th and you could have finished bottom 10 and gotten your pick and and keep it that way. So I think it really depends on what happens to next year's own pick by New York, how they go about it. And we'll see from there. Um, so yeah. Um, and from Adam Leibowitz, I know you prefer Knicks to stay over the cap for Brunson sign and trade, but I'm wondering what, if any advantages there would be for New York clearing cap space and still doing a sign and trade. Maybe Brunson wants fifth year. So um, first and foremost, and Andrew, keep this up for just a second. Uh, don't move it yet. Cause I want to come back to it. Uh, uh, Jeff, who is, he's great. Frank Barrett, one, one, nine, I want to say on Twitter. Uh, great for the Strickland. Um, he asked a similar question about the advantage of staying over the cap versus going under the cap. Uh, if you are a team like the Knicks, you can afford to go over the cap next year and keep going and doing that because the free agent market's not great. You don't really want to have a lot of cap space and then have nothing happen. It's easier. It, the dynamics of the market are sign and trades rule the world right now. That could easily change. You know, it just takes one unrestricted free agent to say, I want to go to another team and that team has cap space and it's done. But until the 2025 TV deal kicks in, when a bunch of teams will then get a lot more cap space and we're looking at maybe 90% of the league having some form of cap space, it makes a lot of sense for the Knicks to stay well over the cap and then they can dip under it that way. Uh, they get a lot of, they get max room. At least that's what they should be planning in this case. Brunson can't get a fifth year from the Knicks, no matter what. The Mavs are the only team that can offer him five years. The question is, if they if they go under the salary cap, they get the room exception, which is about $5 million to spend. Can't combine it with salary cap. It's its own separate thing. If you do that, you can still sign Brunson, clear enough space, then sign a player with the room exception. Great. The other thing is you don't have to worry about Dallas because you've already cleared the space and fine. If you go above the salary cap, you keep the non-tax mid-level exception, it won't turn into the tax mid-level exception because the Knicks are nowhere near the tax apron. The non-tax mid-level exception is about $10 million. The tax is $6 million. Basically, by doing that, you're able to keep that. You also can kind of fool around with the numbers for how to trade it, but it's a little bit more complicated. So again, that's why I think the Knicks are threatening it's, it could be a, a myriad of things, but one of the things they could be doing is threatening Dallas will clear cap space. One of them could be, we don't really want Jaden Ivy that badly. Like I said, one of them could be, yeah, we're still serious about Brunson. There's a lot at play going on right now. So basically to me, the advantage is staying above the salary cap also because I think you probably get better value if you're trading Burks to another team and like, are you getting better value for trading Burks to the Sixers for Danny Green and the 23rd pick, hypothetically? Or are you getting better value trading Danny uh, Alec Burks to a team like the Celtics that has a trade player exception that can just absorb him and then send something back as pick, you know, in the form of a pick? We will find out tomorrow what the Knicks' intentions are. It's not to say that the Knicks can't trade Alec Burks into the trade player exception that the Celtics have moving forward. They can still do that anytime as long as the trade player exception doesn't expire and it shouldn't but there is a second trade player exception that the celtics do have which is just small enough where it fits you can absorb alec burks's salary this year before we go to the next calendar year so if burks gets moved between now and the start of free agency we'll know that the knicks are trying to go under the salary cap um but then there's the other factor of okay Jaden ivy if you get him are you trading more money out than you would be absorbing it Jaden Ivey's making like $4 million more, something like that, than the 11th pick. So how do you go about navigating? There's a lot that's at play. And the craziest part is you could even still do Brunson 
and get Gordon Hayward, and you could do Brunson under the salary cap, then get above the salary cap, then do the trade for Gordon Hayward. So this is why I keep saying it's it's more of an art than a science. There's so many ways you could go about doing this that it's just crazy. Um, but that's essentially the advantage. The Knicks can try to say, all right, Dallas, screw you. We'll do our own thing. Or they could just say, we're here. If he wants us, we're willing to offer the money. Let's just work together and get something done. So that's that's essentially it. That's a good question. Um, Kevin Danishevsky, thank you for the super chat. Is there a world where the Knicks give up both IQ and OB while giving up no draft equity for Ivy? I wouldn't love it, but it would show faith in RJ. I don't think so, mainly because if the Knicks do want to win now, then having those players, I think that's really important to keep them, at least one of them, certainly. I think also we're just at the point where, you know, the Knicks have eight firsts in the next seven years. This is the opportunity. Like when you have a surplus of picks, use them to move up, whether it's this year or next year. But to me, that's the way you can do it. I think you'd also be kind of selling low on uh, on uh, quickly and OB if you did that, whereas the picks, you know, like they fluctuate in value. The Mavericks pick could be 30. It could also be 15 if the Knicks steal Jalen Brunson away and maybe Luka doesn't have a great season. If they even unprotect the pick because then the Mavs have more access to their future picks and something happens to Luka and then suddenly you're looking at a great pick. It's so different. I would say that the Mavs are probably picking somewhere in the 20 to 22 range just to be safe, just because I think the West gets stronger next year. I think the East will get stronger as well. But to me, it's much better to trade the picks than it is the current players on the roster. Knicks are also trying to build something culture-wise, and I think that Quickly and Toppin are key parts to that. You know, the work ethic, they embody a lot of the same traits. Be able to keep that and have this kind of like more young core. Like We could talk about the draft picks. It's exciting. But the thing you sell to potential free agents, to potential trade candidates it's players, it's opportunity, it's winning draft picks are anything. The players that you have can help you get from point A to point B. And I think in this case with IQ and OB with more time, they can help get the Knicks further along the curve than later picks will. So that's why I would stick with that. Stick with the picks, prioritizing that one of cam and Grimes. If there's salary filler that's needed, do that. Otherwise not crazy about it. Uh, Zach Smith, Jeremy for president. Thank you, Zach. Uh, what do you think about the Charlotte news? I think we'll get into the mix there. So the Charlotte news was the Hornets looking to save money in some capacity, and they're willing to maybe attach one of their picks to it. If you've listened to this podcast, you know I've been a very big proponent of finding a way to get that Hayward contract. Here's the thing. I mentioned it on Twitter, and I know there were some Hornets fans that saw it, and they were not happy. If I'm the Hornets, I'm operating like a functional organization and I'm not trading Gordon Hayward and I, I'm not, or at least I'm not attaching a pick to get rid of Gordon Hayward. But that's the thing. It seems that if money is the primary motive, I mean, the report with Kenny Atkinson that his staff wouldn't have gotten paid. Jake Fisher said that the Hornets have consistently been bottom five in staff payments. Um, so if, if frugality is something that Michael Jordan really cares about, then this throws the entire rational conversation of should the Hornets do this out the window, in my opinion. If it were a basketball move, I wouldn't do it, period. And I say that as a Knicks fan. I think this is a, a not great trade for the Hornets. But I think that when you consider the business factors and the money, then it changes things up to the point where, like, is this what we're looking at? Is there more that needs to be changed? I don't really know. But in terms of with the Hornets, I'd love to get in there. I think if there's a way that you can also squeeze out 15 and, you know, maybe it's finding a way to, to like, maybe it's not like this. Let's say hypothetically you can do Burks for, oh, let's say Burks and this and 42 for um, green and 23. I know I'm not the first person to, to bring this trade up, but let's just roll with it. Then from there, maybe you do something where it's 23 to 15 and you're taking on Hayward and you're shipping out, I don't know, again, like Fournier and Kemba. And I understand that Hornets fans may not want Kemba, especially at $9 million, but they would still be saving some money. They're still getting a pick. They're just trading back 
eight spots. Um, there, there, there's a lot of money that clears off the books. There's, there's Kemba's contract. There's Fournier on an expiring deal if they want it to be, um, or it's two years left. They save probably like twelve million dollars, give or take, by doing this deal for the 2023 season when they have to pay PJ Walker uh, Washington when they have uh, Miles Bridges presumably on a big contract. So there's a lot that could be a play there, but that's how I think the Knicks should at least get into the mix. If it's not going to be a straight swap, maybe you use a third team and then, you know, whether it's a three team deal or using a third team and then doing two separate deals, that's something I would try to do if I'm the Knicks. And then maybe you flip 15 to the Kings and they're more interested. We know that they met with Jeremy Sohan. Maybe that they are more interested in four for 11 and 15 and cam and salary, and then we take salary back, we being the Knicks. Like, maybe that's something they can do. It's all about getting creative. If the Knicks want to find a way to turn some of the vets into consolidation and get assets that can help them move up, that to me is a no brainer. Hopefully, the Hornets and their front office feel similarly, and maybe even the Sixers in this case, too. And I guess the Kings and possibly the Pistons. A lot going on, crazy stuff. Darren Hood, hey, Jeremy, I have a question. What do you see the Knicks doing realistically on draft night? Uh, I mean, real isn't realistically being like they do the thing that they don't do, which is staying where they're at. Um, I, I think they'll try like hell to trade up, and I'm hopeful that it'll work out. I, again, I think that I understand that the front office for fans it's kind of left a bitter taste in fans' mouth and mouths, and they want something that's exciting. And then to me, Ivy kills multiple birds with one stone. I also feel like trading down at this point, while I would understand it from a tactical perspective, would almost be a disappointment just in the lens of like, okay, you're telling me the Knicks tried to get to four, couldn't get Ivy, didn't stay at 11, traded down, even if they got another first round pick, you're basically banking on them trading for a high impact player this year or a star next year or trading up significantly in the 2023 draft. I just, I'm willing to be patient, as I've said every year, seemingly for the time I've been a fan. And I'm sure a lot of you have too. For me, I would just feel like, but I want it now. I want Jaden Ivey now. I want a high impact player right now. I don't want to keep waiting. And I think that's something the Knicks have to grapple with. And they have the ability to trade up. Again, it's it's super rare to go from 11 to four. We've had many conversations about how that works. Jaden Ivey, I understand there are also people who then feel like, well, he's not great. These are his flaws and stuff like if he were a perfect prospect, he wouldn't be in the conversation of are the Knicks able to get Jaden Ivey first and foremost. Um, but we've seen what it takes to get from 11 to six in a supposed weaker draft after the top three. It was 2019 and it was Cam Johnson being taken at 11, Jarrett Culver being taken at six and Darius Arch moving up. So theoretically, you would think that, OK. 11 to four, the gap between 11 to six and six to four, you combine the two, something on those lines. So realistically, you know, I'll say 11 because, but every single year the Knicks tried to trade up. So I would not put it past them, but I'll, I'll try to temper my own expectations because I know that it might influence you all to some extent. So let's just say 11 and hope for the best. Uh, Man OF. And I, I, I Please correct me because I've said Mino and Meno. I've heard Chris say Meno, so uh, please let me know. It, Andrew can spot it and inform me afterwards phonetically. Um, Jeremy, with the reports that Mitch is likely resigning, what do you think the contract will look like? We saw something about how it was potentially up to the mid-level exception. That's the current rumor that's going on there. I think what I said was four for 48 was the most I'd do. If you're doing more money, it's six million dollars in non-guaranteed bonuses so if the knicks can get mitch for four forty four years 44 million dollars then that's awesome if they can get him for less then that's even better i don't think his market is nearly as good as it was beforehand and i think deandre ayton's not going to help that either but if you're the knicks you if you can't get a better center than mitch you probably want to wrap things up as quickly as possible because let's say the pistons don't get deandre ayton and then they set their sights on Mitch. Maybe with the more cap space that they have with the grant trade, they're feeling like, hey, I'm cool dropping $14 million or a contract starting at $14 million on Mitchell Robinson. Because how else are we going to spend the money? We're going to be below the salary cap. 
So the best thing would probably be if you feel like Mitch is your guy, get it done. But Mitch could then also say, I don't want to do that. I want to wait out the market. It's a staring contest at that point. Um, all right. We've got some super chat comments that I would love to get to. Let's see. Um, we have Robert Cross. Good friend, Robert Cross. Hello, Robert. Thank you for the super chat contribution. As always and forever, great to see you, Cutlets. Can you give me the statistically st statistical likelihood of Jaden Ivey going to the Knicks tomorrow? Man, you guys are killing me. I, I'll say, I don't know. I said 60% for Randall. I'll say 60% too. But then that goes against everything I just said, which is that my money is on 11 because tempering expectations. So I about 50. And also Robert said hashtag 53 wins. How about this, Robert? 53% chance. There's a 53% chance that it happens. That's for you. Uh, uh, Drawn visual variant. Thank you for the super chat comment or uh, contribution. Great job, Jeremy. Can see a team stealing you one day. Thank you. Uh, do you know why the NBA has the draft before uh, free agency when it seems like it would make more sense the other way around? This has been a gripe of mine for ages, just like with the NFL draft. You have the draft after you have free agency. Why are you planning ahead with the draft? It, it's mind boggling. I, it's yes. If, if that were like, if I could be commissioner for one day and have only one thing to change, it would be this. If I had two things to change, it'd be getting rid of base year compensation. Um, it's just so perplexing, especially because if you're a team that's, banking on free agency, like you would reduce tampering. There'd be almost no tampering because the stress of the draft would be in the, you know, far further away. I mean, yes, would there still be tampering? Sure. But it would be less intense because you don't have to deal with the draft. Um, so I hear you. Hopefully that's something they can change. It'd be nice if they could. Um, I'm also seeing from Andrew for what it's worth that it is Mino. So Mino, thank you for the, the questions. Keep them coming. Um, next. Jessica Clarice Elsner. Hello, Jessica. Your well, well, well tweet, i.e. Charlotte, A plus tweet. Thank you. Yes. I mean, listen, they're all rumors until they happen, but it just it just seems like a situation that is uncomfortable. Thanks to Miles Bridges turning down a contract and being really good. So shout out to Miles Bridges for making this dream happen, whether it turns into a nightmare or is, is reality. I have no idea, but it's something. Uh Ryan Huang, thank you for the uh, super chat contribution. Please tell me Kyrie won't be a Nick. Ryan, Kyrie won't be a Nick. I just don't see it happening. Like, like Kyrie would have to. The best case scenario for him is opting in, but that's also playing into the the Nets' hands because then they say, "Cool, we just kick this can down the road because you have been a nightmare to deal with, and you're under contract this year. That's fine by us." If Kyrie opts out, then that pretty much takes the Lakers off the table because it's a sign and trade and the hard cap doesn't really work for the Knicks. Yeah, you could do a sign and trade. It would actually make sense between the teams. I think there are moves you could make. I just don't want to see it. I don't want Kyrie. Nothing about his track record in the last what four, five years is encouraging. I, I think if the Knicks did sign Kyrie, that my hope would be that it would be you know, an asset play of, okay, let's just acquire him. We can trade him at the deadline or as soon as he's eligible and get something better for him than we would have for whatever salary filler was going out for him. I just don't, it's not worth it. Like I need my sanity and Kyrie, you know, imposes on that. I just, he's, he's a very, very good player. Great player. Some would even say it's just not worth the trouble. Um, Aaron Roy, could you place a percentage for the four following outcomes happening totally into 100%? Trading up, trading down, staying put, trading out. Man, you guys are... I know I know, I give you numbers, but this is killing me. All right, all right. Okay, Aaron. Trading up... Uh, what did I just say? 53% for Robert to trade up for Ivy, so I'll, I'll say that. Trading down 20%. I mean, the math, the math, this is the worst math ever because I'm going to go over 100%. So trading out is the one thing I can say is 1% just because of how granted they'll probably do it now, but the track record of it is so difficult that I just don't, I, I know Jonathan Wasserman talked about, it. I know he did, but it's just not something that really happens. If the, if Knicks can pull it off and do better for it next year, then hats off to them. That's great. 
but I just don't see it. And then staying put. But again, these numbers this just doesn't add up to 100. percent So uh, fine, let's do 53, 30, and 83, 16, and one in that order for trading up. No, that's not right. 53 for trading up, 30 for staying put, 16 for trading down, and one for trading out. These are not scientific at all. Um, just telling you all now. Uh, let's see. Do we have any other contributions at the moment? Ah, yes, we do. Thank you, Andrew. Jason M., the 11th pick for Brogdon makes no sense, but what is the most you would give up for Brogdon? The most I would give up for Brogdon, I would say, from a salary filler standpoint, I do. I look. I know it. It makes sense on paper and not really in real life. Of the whole, like, what if there's a way you can do Randall for Brogdon? And because Randall is, at least in my opinion, a better player than Brogdon, he's certainly a healthier player than Brogdon. Then, are are the Pacers willing to kick something in? But I mean, that's a stretch. I, I, maybe it's not though, considering how the Pacers keep begging or, or insisting that teams are totally interested with the tenth and eleventh picks that someone wants them like there's going to be a price point at which Washington, if it's not the 10th pick feels comfortable, maybe for them, the math is a little bit trickier, but they could probably just get it done with Contavious Caldwell Pope, who is on a non-guaranteed contract that would be guaranteed and then be expiring. And then someone like Kispert Hachimura, one of the, I mean, they have so many wings that it works out. Let's, let's say it's Kispert. Right. Okay. So what are you topping if you're the Knicks? It's, uh, I don't know. You're not going to throw Kemba in there. Like, is it Fournier? Maybe, but then what good does that do? Because even though the math's working, then you're still losing Fournier for a, like, then you have to, you have to worry about your point guard situation because you can't keep Rose theoretically, especially if you're bringing Ivy in. It's a lot. Um, so I'll say this, the most I would do is I would, it would be Randall, but I'd want Brogdon and something else that's an asset coming back. Let it be the, um, the Cavs first round pick, which if they don't make the playoffs turns into two second round picks. Do I think that's great value for Randall? No, I, I don't, but it's the sort of thing where I just, I don't see a lot of the other pieces moving and it's kind of like, okay, you want to probably trade this player. Um, there's a possibility that we want to trade this player. Um, I think there's a match that can be had that way. I do want to say one thing quickly. Uh, gotten a text from Andrew saying um, this is the most most watched uh, live stream that we've had thus far. Um, so I want to thank you all so much. This is awesome. I'm, I'm not done. We're not going anywhere. But uh, I just want to shout all of you out because this is awesome. Really appreciate it. I'm glad that uh, this is all so stressful that we can commiserate together and it could be as cathartic and therapeutic for me to speak as is for you to listen and ask questions. I think that's awesome. So thank you so much. Uh, from XJ, Jay, have you heard about Spurs interest trading nine for Reddish and 11? Could New York do that for better leverage to move to four? I have not heard that. Um, I guess in that case, in I don't think the Spurs have a trade player exception, so it would probably be like nine and Reddish for 11 and Langford. It gets you closer you know, like for sure. The question is, does the trade that gets you to nine and then going from nine to four, is it equal to less than or greater than what you would have to pay to get from 11 to four on its own? That's the one piece that, or I guess a couple pieces that we have missing that we would need to know to make it seem like if it's worthwhile, it is better leverage. It gets you two spots closer. Maybe that works out for them. Like maybe that's something that, that absolutely needs to be had for the Kings where they don't want to go all the way to 11, but if they love Sohan, maybe he's there at 11. There are also a lot of teams that want to seem to trade back. At least that's the rumor. I, I don't think that the seventh pick for the Blazers is up for grabs. Maybe they do want to trade back. Maybe the Pelicans want to trade back. Maybe the Spurs do a lot going on. So um, for that, I would say it's, it, it makes sense, but there are other pieces that we need that I think are just a little bit um, 
tough to discern for this trade. Uh, Mino, Mino F, thank you, Mino. Uh, Jeremy, with all the smoke screens lately, what's a move that hasn't been reported on as much that you could see happening tomorrow? Well, to be quite honest, I probably would have said Jeremy Grant, um, but that has been settled. So cool. Maybe I'll say that, you know, the well, this has been rumored of the Thunder moving up, consolidating in some way to get to eight and then picking Shaden Sharp. That could work out. Other than that, yeah, and I would have said maybe something with Hayward. I would have maintained it, but now that's been announced too. I'll say this. If the if the Thunder want to cause true chaos and just go purely talent without consideration of fit, maybe they view Chet, Jabari, Boncaro, whoever's left at two. But if they take Ivy instead and then everything else just collapses around them, then it's a really interesting thing i wouldn't put it past the thunder to cause chaos it's you know they could rain on our parade the thunder yeah it's great so maybe that's it I'll, I'll throw the wrench in there and say that would be the absolute most chaos that could happen kevin danishevsky if rokas surprised everyone and decided to come over how do you think that would impact the next off season do you see him helping us get a player like ivy in the draft i do think that Rokas's value probably goes up when he's under contract. He has value right now because his contract is zero. But, you know, as he gets closer to his prime, as he has a more prominent role in the NBA, that would be something that gets his value up more. To me, it's, you know, I, I, I still want him to stay away for a little bit. I think you can, if you're keeping Rose, you can get another year out of him. And then you figure it out with Deuce if he's worth keeping. Uh, or, or, you know, maybe you have him in another trade. Maybe at that point you bring in Rokas to be your backup. And then you turn Derek Rose into continuous soup and upgrade in some way. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's turning Rose into a worse contract that's out there next year where you can then take on a pick or, you know, something along those lines. Not quite sure. But I don't think he's going to help with moving up, especially when you consider if the Kings really do want to win right now, and it seems like they do, Rokas doesn't help them. So a more win now asset would be better off. If it were the Pistons, then I could understand it a bit more. They have the time to just kind of take it easy. You know, Cade is really good and he's only had one season under his belt. So there's plenty of time to build around him without the stress. Rokas would certainly be fine with that because they could just, you know, quote unquote tank. And it works out. But I think Rokas is much more of a, let's get him in the building and go from there. But that's the other thing to consider. One of, at least one of, Ro Rokas, IQ, Deuce, probably not here in two years. Just the nature of the business and how it's going to go ahead. Um, that's, that's really the way it goes. Uh, Joe Madden. Randall to Detroit. He fits in that trade player trade exception trade exception. Detroit just got um, Randall cam and 11 for five. Julius would not fit into the trade player exception. At least something, unless something has broken while I have been on air Grant's salary is less than Julius's. So he, it would not be absorbed. What have to happen is in the new league year, the Pel the Pistons would have to, renounce that trade player exception and then the Knicks could dump that salary whether or not the Pistons want to do that is a completely different story but that's sort of how it would go and then if it's after that happens I mean yes you could agree to the trade and then make it work and consummate it in the new league year my guess is it wouldn't happen but listen if it does happen kudos to you because there there are ways to do it um, I don't want to rule it out it just it seems like it's not the most likely of scenarios. Zach Smith, say Ivy goes to four to someone else. Someone, do you have any interest in trading up to seven or is it Ivy at four or 11 for you? Zach, I think it's a great question to ask Chris. He is much more knowledgeable about this stuff with the draft than I am. I think he'll give you some much better insight than I can provide. So um, as long as if they find star talent, I'll say this, if they find star talent that's on the board 
and they really believe in that player, then do it. If they don't, stay at 11 or consider if the value dropping down and getting an asset that way beats what you can get at 11. I still think the value at 11 is probably better than that, but you don't know. Like it, it could change. It could fluctuate. It all depends on what deal is there. That's certainly how we go about it. Um, Aaron Roy, is it now possible to send Burks and Noel to Portland without taking Bledsoe? No, it's not. It, that deal is kaput. Finito off the table, unfortunately. This went into the trade player exception. Now it would have to be Bledsoe coming back. This is another reason why I wish the Knicks would stay above the salary cap if they want to go with Brunson because you don't have a whole lot of options for dumping Burks and Noel and Kemba for no salary. And granted, you probably don't have to dump all three as long as you don't take on more money. Um, you probably would want to dump all three even if you get a little bit of money back, but you have to essentially find the perfect trade player exception to fit with these players or the perfect team with cap space that wants them for very little. If you're going to trade depth to Portland, have it be using Bledsoe. Again, this, that's the only way they can do it now. But to me, that's why staying above the cap is a better option. You don't have to be so picky with deals. You can be a little bit more um, open. And flexible, which is really important. Justin Schwender, since reports are stating that the Knicks are gearing toward clearing cap space for Jalen Brunson, what do you believe is the easiest route for them to make that room? Preferably without using capital. Yeah, again, I think it's it's moving Alec Burks for no money back, right? This this is the trickier part. This is an easier question to answer after the draft because of the fact that the pick that the Knicks have will have a cap hold and that will then impact how much money the Knicks can spend in free agency. Let's say they stay at 11. I think they have about $2.9 million in cap space as is if they want to operate below the cap. If they want to operate above, they keep Taj's cap hold on the books. So we'll operate with $2.9 million. If you can dump Alec Burks to a team like Boston into their trade player exception for no money back, you create about $13 million. If you can find a home for Nerlens Noel, I've brought up Utah before. If they trade Rudy Gobert, they have a trade player exception that can just fit Noel. That's another option. And then you clear off Noel's nine or so million dollars. And then if you're looking at Kemba, maybe you find a not great salary where you could trade Kemba and a second for like Garrett Temple. The, the Pelicans pay a little bit. I don't think the Pelicans would do that for what it's worth, but like, think of that type of deal. That is where you operate in that sense. And again, I really don't think that Neuron Zoel is viewed as a negative contract. I think he's just very neutral. He's, he's, a, he, you know, he's a rim protector where it's an, it's an expiring contract. If you want it, I understand you can get him for the vet minimum. I understand you can get him for room exception or the non-tax mid-level exception, but I think there are enough contracts where you can make it work. But we're talking about dumping them completely. So to me, I think you could you could potentially find a way for, to trade those players for little to no salary back and essentially push in terms of the asset value. Then if you're able to get Brunson, you sign him, and it works that way. But still not my preference, as I've beaten this dead horse many a times. Um, maybe the Mavericks. I mean, their mascot's a horse. Are they beating... Is that the dead horse? Who's to say? Uh, from Andrew, a Knicks Film School programming note. Jeremy, John, Andrew, and Benji will be live on the KFS YouTube channel providing live reaction to every lottery pick. Uh, we will have our Twitter notifications on. That's just the nature of the game. But please join us tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is when we are doing this. Um, really excited to do it. Hope you can join us, obviously. Um, in the meantime, while Andrew pulls up the next comment, I'm actually going to look at some of these notifications that are going on here to catch up, see if there's anything that we are missing. Uh, all right. Some Jeremy Grant stuff. Yep. So it was from Keith Smith with Jeremy Grant off the books and no salary returning. I now project the Detroit Pistons have just over $56 million in cap space in July. Um, just saying $56 million that gets you 30 and a half, 30 and a half for Aiton. And 25 for Brunson, as I was saying earlier, 
that's it. That like, that's the math. That's how they're, they could potentially try to do it and retool. And I'll say this, if that happens and you're the Knicks, you want to trade that Detroit second round pick because it's going to lose its value before it's like somewhere around 35 with Cade and Brunson and Aiton. Like, is it around 40, 42, 44? I don't really know. It takes time to, for Cade to, you know, keep going and going. But when you're that good to begin with, maybe you don't need a whole lot. Um, let's see. Um, oh, was Josh Hart traded? Including the $12.9 million non-guaranteed contract, Josh Hart. Portland has a hundred. Okay. Never mind. He was not. That's just, that was just Bobby Marks, uh, speaking. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Mars Jetson. How would this, how would the news of Burke surgery affect his value? So for those in C, Alec Burks has, he had foot surgery. It seems like he's going to be fine for training camp. Uh, so I would imagine his trade value is totally fine. As long as he's not going to miss games, as long as it's not chronic, then I think he should be fine. It's interesting, the timing of it. This could have been released a while ago because he had the surgery some time ago. It's uh, it's almost like um, this is the time to drop that knowledge. I think Schwinn even said that to me, and it was a good point. Like Now is when... You want to just like, hey, have it out in the open. No surprises. We're fielding offers for him. He's going to be healthy. But he did get surgery for full disclosure. So that's the Knicks communicating through the media, which I think is important in that sense. Um, It's good that teams have that idea. Otherwise, if they don't, um, kind of going in blind. Jason M., how mad were you at Tibbs when you heard the Burks news? Mad because of the fact that there's a sentiment among a lot of Knicks fans that Burks is just not a good player. And he is. He's a good rotation piece. He's a really good rotation piece. Like, there are a lot of teams that could have used him in the playoffs. But his value was lower. Uh, Playing point guard, like it's not his position. It hurt him. I really think it did. So hopefully the the Knicks took a bet. The bet is we're not going to trade Burks cam and noel for only like one first and a second we're going to try to do it now we're going to we're going to try to push it to the summer and we think we get a better deal we'll have to evaluate them if they can get a better deal for those three players if all three of them are gone kudos to them for waiting if they didn't then uh that trade deadline that was so anxiety ridden uh, not fun not fun JG, Blazers is going to sign Grant and Aiton. Seems unlikely. This probably, there was, I think Jake Fisher reported that the Blazers didn't feel great about Aiton to begin with. So this takes them out of the running because they, they'd have to do a sign and trade. So when I say takes them out of the running, yeah, they could do a Simon sign and trade, you know, double sign and trade. It's rare. It happens. KD and D'Lo, it happened um, because of the double sign trade in terms of base year compensation. That's how you get the math to match. But I think they just said, we're not going to get Aiton. We can get a pretty good deal with Jeremy Grant. We just take his salary. That's it. We can still um, flip Bledsoe for something. We can re-sign Nurkic. We get Dame back. We can keep Hart. It makes sense. And actually, I feel like if you're a Knicks fan, you're rooting like hell for a team like the Blazers because if they're better than the Mavs, then that pick drops. Granted, and 26, 27 hours from now, we could say, who cares? It's with the Kings. Doesn't matter. Um, uh, Kevin Danishevsky, thank you for the super chat contribution. With Washington emerging as the new dumpster of the NBA after they take Brogdon for the 10th pick for us, can they pair Ju- uh, Julius with their other um, as big? So, yeah, I mean, the Wizards to me are the NBA's purgatory right now. they're doing what the Knicks did, but the Knicks at least tanked (laughs) at one point. Uh, They tanked for RJ and they got him right now. They're just, they just want to be good around Bradley Beal. And as long as he resigns and they're going to try to stay good, Uh, they could always Blake Griffin him, but I don't see it happening. Um, In terms of Julius, 
we're looking at realistically, let's say they trade Brockton, they trade for Brockton and it's probably, you know, like I said, um, Caldwell Pope and one of the wings, take your pick. Then you're basically saying, okay, um, we have Kuzma. Are we trading Kuzma? I, I, I think Kuzma is a better player. At least he had a better season than Randall did last year. Randall's high in his all NBA season was certainly better than what Kuzma's had so far. But then you're looking at Porzingis because they don't have a whole lot of salary that's left to be expendable and move in that situation. And that's a problem. So are you doing a third team? Like maybe here's one idea. Uh, if you are a team like hell, the Kings, we knew that Kuzma, there was some possibility of having him move to the Kings before he was traded to the wizards. Didn't work out, obviously, if that's the sort of thing where you do, you move Kuzma to one team, one team sends something to um, the Knicks and the Knicks move Julius to Washington. That is essentially how you would have to go about it. I, I, what that is, it's, it's a little bit more complex. I'd have to probably take a moment to process it and think about it. I don't really know. That's where the fit would be in. I just don't think it could be, you know, it could be that if they do that, it's like, Brad, we want to build on your timeline. We want to commit to you. We're not worrying about the younger guys. It's you we're focused on. That would certainly help. But also Kuzma is a win now player. Then it's the Porzingis conversation. It's not a conversation I'd love to have. I don't really want Porzingis. I'd understand why they would do it. I wouldn't like it. I would want more back than Porzingis. But I just don't. I just everything we've seen, everything we've heard from the time he was a Nick to the time he was leaving the Mavs. Like it's just not something that interests me at all. Maybe there's a way he could be moved to a third team and do exactly what I said with Kuzma, but instead with Porzingis, but you'd have to find a taker. And I don't know of too many takers that might want Porzingis. Um, I see a pinned chat from Andrew. Uh, Andrew, is this, is this our farewell? Or am I just saying this in general? Because I'm happy to keep going. But if this is our farewell, then I respect you need a break. So let me know. But in the meantime, uh, yes, haha. Okay. This is my cue to wrap up. So uh, thank you for tuning in for Cream tonight. Uh, join Chris for Dream at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then join all of us tomorrow for our live uh, draft live stream. So yes. All right. Um, for my moment, thank you all. This has been really great. I'm really excited for the next 24 hours. And by really excited, I mean uh, really anxious and wanting to throw up all over the place. But you help me not want to throw up all over the place. So thank you. Um, do have some really good content just mentioned with Chris coming up. Um, we'll be doing this again next Wednesday. This will be a lot of fun. Get to keep doing it. It'll be the 29th. And then the 30th, we will be doing something for free agency. So stay tuned for plans that we may have but until then um thank you all enjoy your night enjoy chris um and that's how cap rules everything around me <laughs>